Guten Tag! Es ist der Cyberduden. Duden? Duden? Dudes. Der Cyberdudes. Duden sounds weird. Like, that sounds like it could be a euphemism. It, it could be, you know, something that if you have to ask how much it costs, you can't afford it. Right? One of those. <laughs> <laughs> right? So. No, let's not do that. Shout yeah. out. The Cyber Dudes podcast. Um, I'm, I'm not gone. I've not gone crazy. I don't actually have it, an, and I don't have any German uh, background to me. I'm going in a couple of weeks, uh, so I'm kind of just getting in the mood. Nice, uh, congrats. Yes, thank you. Uh, does it really need congrats? Anywho, I'm Robin Thornton. As always, it's the Cyber Dudes podcast in English. We are not going to be conducting any of this in German. Uh, Omar Sangarim is with me, as always. Hello, Omar. How are you? How are you? V Gates. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> Thanks, Robin. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. Um, I knew I nearly ended up in a. It's a podcast that I follow called the Tifo Football Podcast. Um, one of the guys is now based in Germany, and the guy who hosts it typically says, "Ah, uh, uh, hello, sir. But V Gates, how are your gates doing?" <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just really silly. I, I swear that's where I get kind of some of the, the inspiration for silliness from this. Anyway, what's uh, anything caught your eye recently in the cyber world? What's going on? No, not anything more than I think your uh, your run of the mill folks are trying to figure out how to get their arms around AI. I think that's going to be quite the uh, the back and forth battle. Uh, forever, um, the uh, the Daily Show, right? The, the the one episode that I watch every week now because John Stewart is back hosting. That was a you know AI was was big. Uh, yes, so I caught that yesterday or this morning. Huh. It was Monday's episode, but you know that's the only one I watch. So yeah, AI. What else? Is new? Cool. Yeah. yeah, I have to admit, didn't dislike Trevor Noah, but Stewart's the OG. Yes, it really is. There's, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing that quite quite slaps like a mm -hmm. bit of uh, like a bit of John Stewart. Ah, yep. oh, anyway, right. So speaking of speaking of cyber puckery, pardon my French. We'll drive. We'll dive straight into the news. We've got a, our feature in ten fifteen minutes. However long the news takes us is, is a little thing called Stuxnet. Uh, if you're not familiar, then uh, you're in for a wild ride. But we start first with news that Microsoft could have prevented Chinese cloud email hack. U.S. Cyber Report says this is a pretty damning little piece of a uh, little nugget of information. Turns out towards the end of last year, a Chinese uh, state linked, we believe, hacking group called Vault Typhoon got into Microsoft through, I think there was their cyber division. I think they got into finance as well. And actually, for a, a, a three, three trillion dollar company like Microsoft having their cyber division um, wangled is is not a particularly good look. So, uh, but it's it seems as though it was easily avoidable, and Microsoft was somewhat, was somewhat negligent there. Uh, Other story, we have YouTube video game hacks contain malware links. Uh, so this is this is videos on YouTube for people who want to cheat at video games, like online ranked video games, and some clever sods are deciding to lure people in with those kinds of videos and install malware on their PCs. I've never really, I don't understand the point of cheating on ranked play because the moment the the moment the hack or the cheat gets found out or eradicated you're going to get found out too you're going to be right back down where you belong so whatever uh cyber attacks wreaking physical disruption on the rise this actually goes a little bit to our main feature here so this is from dark reading ransomware groups tore into manufacturing um other parts of the operational tech sector in 2023, and few attacks caused eight and nine figure damages. That's kind of not surprising for us. Uh, but worst is yet to come in 2024. That's nice. Good, good bit of ominousness there. I have a feeling this is one that you're going to want to uh, dive into a little bit. Uh, fourth out of the six, we've got Federal Trade Commission says that Americans lose 1.1 billion to impersonation scams in 2023. 
So according to according to the stats compiled by the FTC, a uh, figure that is three times higher than 2020. So there's a lot of, I mean, a, a, I guess the question there is, are people falling for them more regularly or are more of them getting committed? I'm, I'm inclined to believe it's the latter. I mean, and we've, we talked about this as well as regards to the pig butchering scam piece i think we discussed last week or, or last episode so there's there's a lot going on there uh open ai's voice engine can clone a voice from a 15 second clip well this is scary there's a little bit of good in it so far because despite apparently the model's advanced capabilities the this article from Zed, uh, zdnet says open ai has not yet released it to the public now this is problematic in terms of things getting into the wrong hands because, and it's this is now why I do not answer phone calls that which I do not recognize the number, or if I do, out of sheer sort of curiosity, it gets hello, very quick, not enough to make an imprint of my voice. Although having said that, this is going on on YouTube, so someone could probably just make an imprint of my voice of this and then. Ah, uh, whatever. Um, it's the risks we take. But the cloning of voices for usage in fraud. Uh, never a good thing. And finally, oh, topic of the last couple of weeks, how the Baltimore Bridge collapse spawned a torrent of instant conspiracy theories. I read actually on this, and I don't think it's this article here, but I read that the cyber conspiracy theories were largely fueled by everybody's favorite misogynist Andrew Tate. So, which of these which of these uh which of these little stories do you want to sink your teeth into, Omar? I think uh near and dear to my heart, Baltimore. I I had the joy, the trouble uh of living in Baltimore for 8 months. So, you know, it's it was great. Shout out to everyone, I say out the Mason Dixon line. Uh, although now I'm thinking about it, I don't know if Baltimore qualifies. I, I I don't know exactly where it is. I should know. I'm watching Manhunt on Apple TV, so I probably should uh, should should brush up on that. But the second I saw Baltimore, one of the it's, oh hey, I used to live there. Um, also I was on this bridge. Um, sadly, uh, it really didn't. It wouldn't really take a tanker. To take this thing out, I'll just I'll just put it I'll put it there to to start. Um, I was know. surprised how quickly it fell. I, I mean, I know, I know gravi should've. gravity gravity is a thing, but I kind of expected like, when you I shouldn't be surprised. No, when I saw the when I saw the headline, I think I, I must have, I woke up about what six thirty or something like that, and like the first thing that probs up is BBC News because I still have that on my phone. Sure. And I was looking at it, I was like, oh god, bridge collapse opens up literally the first thing that is there is the video and then i see damn that's a long bridge press play and i'm expecting like a section to go another section like yep. maybe 10 20 seconds later then another yes, one yeah. it's like yep. no just boom, 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 boom. oh yeah it's an erector set anything any sadly the infrastructure down there is is pretty is pretty garbage um you know and i say sadly because you know it it's a vital obviously piece uh, of uh of infrastructure. It's, one of, it's one of three crossings along 95 through through Baltimore, isn't it? Exactly. And it's um and it really doesn't take a lot to back things up down there anyway. God um no. oh goodness. So yeah, yeah, you've traveled down there multiple times, right? Yeah. For, you yeah. you close one lane on the Fort McHenry and all hell breaks loose. It's it's then it's it's hand to hand combat to mm -hmm. get the hell out of there and then you have to oh, figure you, things out. You'd yeah. be fine. I uh, well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yes and no though. It is Baltimore. I'm not playing <laughs> All right, I'm not Superman here, right? I can't dodge bullets. Uh, but what gets me is my introduction to the conspiracy theories here were what I truly thought was like an onion slash, you know, cheeky Reddit post on Jewish space lasers, right? And I just look, I start going down the rabbit hole here and I'm just like, how is this still a thing, right? Like, how is this conspiracy? Like, I, I kept reading and I go, oh, no, no, that's, oh, what people actually, oh, yeah. You mentioned Andrew Tate, right? Like, as if anyone with three brain cells to rub together should take anything he says seriously at this point. Like, how do you get 
arrested, let call. go, and then arrested again by the Romanian police, right? I don't, this, it just, it, I, I don't know. Like, if there's a Razzie award for being a human, right? Like, just, are there awards for being a real shit-tastic human being? You know, he'll sweep, I think, every year at this point. Him, his brother, his cousin, whoever else is involved in all that stuff. So I don't understand how he's... Well, I do, sadly, because the internet is 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 a uh, den of villainy, right? Like uh, good old uh, Moss Eisley. But I, I just can't... I can't get over, you know, things that normal folks would just, you know, say and not have to do the slash S on Reddit, right? You would just read, hey, it's sarcastic. No, these are things that need to be sadly addressed and completely discounted. I uh, would like to go on record as saying the cyber dudes completely do not endorse the whole Jewish space laser conspiracy, nor a thousand percent of whatever Andrew Tate uh, is spewing. And even... Even suspending my disbelief, right? I used to like watching pro wrestling. You know, you just have to suspend your disbelief and just enjoy the spectacle. Yeah. Uh, I like to dip my toe in a couple conspiracy uh, conspiracy theories here and there. Um, these are straight oh, up fun. Expensive. Oh, they're fun, exactly. But these yeah. are straight up ridiculous. Um, and honestly, not what's needed right now <clears throat> in terms of mm-hmm. trying to you know track down. There was these things were going hot and heavy when folks were still in the drink. They were trying to yeah. they were trying to still fish them out. Unfortunately, um, yeah. there was the whole thing about you know who's who was the captain during the time. Like it, it's really a rabbit hole that you know it was it was terrible. It was terrible. So, th- so this is where I think. I mean, lambasting Tate for spreading just completely unsubstantiated claims. His was. One of the ones that was somewhat more credible in the, because I remember when I watched this thing and I said, and it, and it was, you know, reading about it and it says, you know, tanker lost power. My first thought as somebody who works in the cyber industry was going, I very much doubt that this is actually the case. There's probably an Occam's razor scenario going on here that this True. is way simpler and mundane, more mundane than a tanker's propulsion systems being hacked. But I could see it. It's sure. kind of Hollywood, but it's not out of the realms of possibility. The problem that the problem with what Tate did was said it with such conviction of yes, this was a thing that happened. It's like no, it's not. There's no evidence to there's no evidence to support that. It's pure conjecture. Shut up and let NTSB do their job. And sadly, and this is not exactly a position I often find myself in. But uh, NTSB <laughs> needed some space. <laughs> Let them do what they're going to It's a wild time when I'm going pro NTSB. I'm getting the bumper sticker. But in NTSB, this case, they've been busy recently. They sadly, yes. Sad, that's, yeah. a, that's never, it's one of those things where you don't want them to be, right? Let's, let's, let's shoot them a paycheck and hope everyone's safe. But unfortunately, this is one of those situations where they needed to, to, to step up. But I just, and and to your point, sometimes it's those, there's enough, it doesn't strain credulity that much. Mm. And then it starts bringing in folks going, okay, and it just, it gives him more credibility or the source, whatever it is, you know, punching yeah. down at this point and Andrew Tate, right? Like, but any, any of these, the it's closer, not yeah, it's not, it's, it's, <laughs> it's exactly right. You know, it's a very low bar. You just kind of skip over it, but it's one of those where it does start to build up like a snowball effect of credibility, which I don't think should be ever granted uh, to a lot of these. And again, just you can pivot into some pretty nefarious, terrible racist nonsense mm. that I just think, yes, categorically uh, throw it out. So, yeah. Okay, cool. What else tickled your fancy out of the six we oh, uh, oh, we've got? The voice, the voice emulation. That, Ooh, of course, nice. I, I mentioned AI at the top of the intro here. And this is just one of those things that I think we're going to see more and more of. It's I'm on the fence here because, as you said, it can be it can be cool. It can be awesome. It can be nice. I, I read another story kind of auxiliary to this of there's now startups that are going to offer as a solution or as a service, they record family members and then you can talk to them after they pass. 
it's a little bit cyberpunky. It's a little, and it, but it gives you a whole, like you can enter a metaverse arena, I guess, and then essentially converse with folks that have been replicated. You know, they, they take a recording. It's essentially like uh, almost, you know, you, you, free, you, you, you freeze your head and hope that they're able to resuscitate you later. Kind of like hey, Futurama. Yes, I, I knew you would, I knew you would, you'd pick that up. Um, so, but it's really, but it's, it really tugged at the heartstrings, right? My dad died a few years ago. We hadn't been talking for a bit. So maybe, you know, wouldn't it be, you know, give people some closure. But sadly, as you said, like how you, we interpret all news through the lens of what we do day to day. I read that story. And the first thing I thought of was what this story hmm. is telling us about which is holy crow um it, you can't even believe what you see and hear anymore yeah. you know, on, on the other end of a communication channel so this one is just terrible well terrible. so this is this is something that i've i've been saying i've been parroting ever since i heard the stories about people being contacted by their loved ones mm -hmm. um through voice cloning to say set up like safe phrases or, yes. or or security phrases yes. with your loved ones to make sure that if you are like if it's ever an, a, a situation of hysterical i'm in trouble and i need i need getting bailed out of jail or whatever else it may be yeah. i mean i'm i'm in deep with the wrong people that you can it, it could be an inside joke it could be it could be anything just yeah. something that somebody else isn't going to know or, or get glean, or understand. Or glean is the thing. I yeah. think your, your advice was great because you said, treat it like <clears throat> even your passwords, right? Where you're not going to be able to go. It's just a combo of your three dogs names or some, yeah. some lame stuff like that. No, you want it to be something that's, it can be an inside joke, but it's also very hard to guess. Yeah. But it always, it gets to, or, or just even something from way, like obscure, like way in the past or something like that. Because you always see this. And I think the, the example that strikes me is the, there's something in The Witcher where there's like a shape-shifting bloke. And it's like, oh, do you remember such and such? And, and, he's, like, and he's playing along and he you know does the improv thing and gives the positive response. And it's like, and she goes, but you hated that. And that's how it gets found out and mm -hmm. everything all goes sideways. But it's one of those things where it's just, you know, have something that you know only that person is going to know and then run with that to see whether it's credible, especially if it's a panic scenario. Sure. I'm, I'm really seeing the problems though, even with the, even with the startups that can extend the presence of loved ones after sure. they pass sort of thing. Cause that you could really start screwing with people. Absolutely not. Yet. Grief is a potentially really easy thing to mm -hmm. to turn on someone. Yep. I don't like that. No, it's it's very much it's an Ian, it's an Ian Malcolm like preoccupied yeah. with whether or not we can, whether or not we should. Good, mm. and and it's and it's one of those things where you know, just from a psychological perspective, that's a that's a wild ride. But also, I think what you're hinting at with the practical aspects of it. Right. For goodness sakes, there's a whole there's a whole reason why, you know, the, the, the joke in Shameless was, you know, Frank, the, the main character there, William H. Macy, was still cashing, you know, his dead mother's checks or his supposedly yeah. dead mom's checks. This is you know, this can be actually leveraged. There's a whole plethora of reasons why this is um, Sidewaysville, I think, just barreling down the highway towards Sideways Town. I don't I, again, can and should. It's yeah. And, and what gets me, and I think is where this, we both agree here, this has been around for a bit or this type, t type of technology, the capability to do so. But I think it's the fact that there's so now lessened barriers to entry for utilization, right? That open the door to be, it being ubiquitously leveraged. That's where it's why now it's, this is, this is scary. It's yeah. It's not just. It's now not just the preserve of the multi-billion-dollar conglomerates and the intelligence services. Sure. It's it's your standard scammer in Cambodia or yeah. Thailand or, or even in editing, India or some other. Even pictures it. and whatnot now, right? That's the next. You know, I I saw yeah. I saw a snippet. I didn't read it this morning, and I go, oh, there goes Photoshop's whole business model. Now, if you can just start mm. editing pieces not to mention again 
the nefarious practical applications thereof. It, we're in a weird time. The Photoshop thing is an interesting one because I think that you'll then end up in a scenario where, because I think we had this with lab grown meat, yes. where there started to be this question that would come along, with, which was to say, real, real organic meat from cow or pig or sheep or whatever horse will still exist with horse yeah in the case of in the case of tesco's lasagnas yes very much so <laughs> my fellow brits will understand that joke from a few years ago <laughs> findus lasagnas from romanian Ooh, horses oh mm, yay. Yikes. <laughs> god that's a throwback um there was some there was there was some really funny jokes like uh, throwing like banding around about that one as well. There's something like there's the uh, oh do you want um all all who want lasagna for dinner say yay, all who don't say nay. <laughs> <laughs> they rate themselves, especially once it's found <laughs> out. So good. Oh, come on. All opposed nay. Hey. Um <laughs> Christ. Yeah. But there was, yeah, so there's the question, you know, and it, things that are AI generated, will they be kind of, kind of like, um, kind of like synthetic diamonds, sure. you know, lab, lab, lab made diamonds. Mm -hmm. They, they, you know, genetic, oh, no, well, not genetically in the case of diamonds, because they're not organic, but not yet. Um, <laughs> living diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> this has gone so off the rails. Now we're getting into D and D territory here. I just want to let you so, know. This is so stupid. I wouldn't actually know, but this is so stupid. Yeah. But you know, synthetic diamonds. You know, chemically chemically identical. It's basically just that big carbon lattice thing. But it, they go for cheaper because they haven't yeah. come from suffering in Sierra and, and they're Canadian or usually so wherever else. Yeah, cheaper. exactly. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, it's it's and the same with meat. You know, will organic meat demand a higher price point, but the lab grown stuff will be just as well, not sure just as good, but will be, yeah, will be, you know, good enough mm -hmm. and way cheaper. Same goes for human produced art or human produced graphic design mm -hmm. versus what a what an AI model has managed to do. Because again, that's that, that one thing, one of the things that, um, I find doesn't uh, doesn't quite track in AI yet, and I'm not sure it will for a good while. Is noses, chins, and hands? Oh, those are always never quite look right. They're always the telltale yeah. signs. Yep. and then eyes as well sometimes sure. because you'll end up with like a double pupil or something like that. Yep. And those are the things I still think that it'll take a good while for that. Um, I, this might be naivety. But I still think it's a, it'll take a good while for that to get perfected. Whereas a human can just go, "That's not." It's the uncanny valley problem. Yep. And the human can see the uncanny valley issue, mm -hmm. and maybe the computer won't quite get there. There'll always be something that's just kind of wrong enough that if you look close enough, like the newspapers did at the Kate Middleton photo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> good. Poor girl, leave her alone. She's going through a tough. Right. Oh, I'm not having a go. Yeah. When that came when that came out, it was cancer. I was like, I knew it straight away. Of course, knew that was going to be that. Yeah. Anyway, final story because uh, extended news segment. We'll clip some of that out. Sure. Final uh, news story. What, think, what, what tickled you fancy? I think you hit the nail on the head <laughs> in terms of the the cyber attacks wreaking physical havoc. Uh, shout out to you know my my compatriots on the side gig for teaching. Uh, this is essentially what he does. He goes on site and he tests. Um, you know, a lot of physical manufacturing type plants, uh, you know, water treatment facilities, <laughs> all that, all that fun stuff. And, um, as anyone, I think in the industry, ourselves included, uh, oh Lord, can't believe that this thing is still going, right? It's just, it's just the, the magnitude and the depth of potential vulnerabilities in a lot of these spaces are very terrifying. And it's really, it ups the ante, I think, when it's a water treatment plant when it's part uh, in a, a essential part of the grid for a, a, a spot when it's the winter in the Northeast or when it's the winter across mm -hmm. the Midwest of the U S or, you know, shout out to Canada. I don't, I'm not just ragging on you. I'm going to give you, you know, you, you have some of the coldest winters on record. God bless. It's scary. Or, or, or Texas with the isolated power grid, Texas with the power grid or, <laughs> or flip it the other way, right? Like what happens during the blistering summer, 
and you knock out the AC in a ton of places. Again, Texas with their isolated <laughs> that, power. Grid. That's very true. You know, but um, yeah, if, if anyone's going to get ahead of this curve, I think it, I'll, I'll leave it to them. God bless. But this, it's terrifying. And I think what, for me, it's always going to be an inflection point was the colonial pipeline. I think in this country yeah. where, um, you know, to, I, I always, this is old faith, but I always bring it up. The hackers said, sorry, once they realized exactly what was going on and the FBI said, no, cool, we don't care. So yeah, I, it's now a diplomatic incident. Absolutely is. Number one. Number two, I think they, um, you know, and, and this is going to uh, dovetail into Snuxnet. When a government agency wants to go after something so badly that they put their cards on the table like this. And in, in this case, the FBI kind of showed, hey, we found ways to claw back crypto payments. That's a whole can of That's porn. such a game changer. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And in terms of the ins and outs of how exactly would be a whole whole episode unto itself, which I'm down to dive into because that stuff is is pretty neat. But here Dude, I, plan it and run with it. I'm oh, I'm so happy to do that. Right? Like that's gonna be a fun <laughs> one. We can even get maybe get a guest star, right? Have have the, the gentleman I referenced. Uh or there's a couple of folks Love I it. know who who are, are big into the crypto hacking space. But this this is terrifying, right? Like what happens if you know, I go now, you know, you'll see the, I don't know if you can see it in the background, a little bouncer, right? If I go to yeah. give my daughter a bath and the water doesn't work, right? Mm. Or come on now, or, or it's cold. That we, yeah. that happened to us in February. This yeah. is this stuff. And, and it's, it's only going up because I think uh, it's still a, a lot of industries. This is one of, one of those that lags so far behind in terms of taking taking this seriously. And it's always, in a lot of cases, what, what a few folks in that space have, have told me is the common CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, gets mm -hmm. flipped to AIC or ACI. It's always availability up front. If it's something where yeah. it's a manufacturing plan, if it's something where, of course, if it's a water treatment facility, <clears throat> they want to keep it up and running at all costs. Confidentiality and integrity of data are definitely distant seconds. In, in those cases, which I understand, but there has to be a way humans can come or, come to an agreement and go, we can figure this out, right? We can keep yeah. we can keep things safe while up and running, but the, the who, money's there. Who, yeah. yeah. Who who gives a crap about who gives a crap about the integrity or the confidentiality of your power plants data? Well, it might for nuclear one the confidentiality piece, but sure. quite frankly the the availability aspect of that, because if you don't have anywhere to, if you can't get that energy out, if you can't get that electricity out, it's got to go, it's got to go somewhere. Okay. So it's either going to get wasted. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to shut, you're going to have to slow down or mm -hmm. essentially shut down your reactor. That's not a necessarily an easy restart. Or it's, even, yeah. it's even worse if you're coal, because oh, those 100%. things, those things have to be shut down very, very slowly very and slow. they can collapse if you yeah. just turn them off. And they take a while to flip back on again, as you're saying. Exactly. Again, yeah. yeah. But, um, I mean, most, most absolutely scary is if your uranium enrichment plant Good Lord. goes down. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is, I mean, how many, right, sci fi or action movies have we read? where we just basically touched on the plot of a lot of them with those three stories, but now it's reality. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So speaking of uranium enrichment, let's, uh, let's <laughs> delve into Stuxnet. Well, that's specifically why <laughs> I did that. Yeah. God forbid. Cause it's, yeah, cause it's a very everyday thing that people are terrified that there are uranium enrichment plant, uh, enrichment facility gets shut down. That's a very commonplace happening for everybody in society. <laughs> so our feature today is, and it's a nice little segue from critical national infrastructure and, and physical cyber attacks. This was really was the dawn of physical cyber attacks. Let me ask you first, before we get into it, what do you, what do you know of Stuxnet? Well, quite a lot i imagine i it's it's one of those where you know if you, if you study europe you're going to study the wars right if you study the united states i mean there's a couple of really spicy things i could bring up but you're going to study you know the wild west uh a couple of other, right? there's, <laughs> there's of course other things but when when you get into this field as the two of us are this is one of this is just such a watershed <laughs> seminal moment i think it's uh but the most recent i think engagement, mental engagement that I had with it was um, 
the book, uh, this is how they tell me the world ends. And it's just a, a general, it's a, it's a great read and it includes, you know, allusions to Stuxnet and, uh, but with the perspective of now there's a whole gray market for zero days essentially uh in, in the rest oh, of the, yeah the, the hacks that nobody knows exist until until they happen and and the market for them yes the straight up just essentially yeah, like a it, bazaar of 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 buying and selling yeah yeah because it's cyber element of surprise mm-hmm. isn't it mm-hmm. a zero day yes it is you know, what better what better thing to hit somebody with than something that they don't know that they're vulnerable of to? course and you know and th- this one that we'll <clears> get into right it's stacked I, I think like six or seven if i remember correctly um uh kind of in line right and um you know again it just it unlocked the potential of you can stockpile zero days the same way you would stockpile you know kinetic munitions or nuclear missiles or you know and it would have that sort of effect on a on on an organization or, or an area and i think if anything since it's happened as we'll get into, uh, I think the world's, of course, much more connected. So the possibility of something like this happening or that this is constantly going on, I think is very high. So this is the story of Stuxnet. We are not going to go into as much detail with it as you mentioned about stacking of zero days there. Because one, one thing that's interesting about this is that the, the details or the public details around it are sparse-ish. They're a little bit sketchy. Mm-hmm. This was a tale of espionage, specifically cyber espionage, a little bit Mission Impossible. And we'll I'll elaborate on why I said that in a few minutes. But it's useful to get a little bit of background on this. So the Stuxnet story could reasonably be traced back to the 1940s, 1950s. The Shah of Iran... The Brits, Americans, finding oil in Iran, were very cosy with the Shah at the time and wanting to maintain a government and and political relations with individuals who were friendly to them. So essentially British Petroleum could just grab all all, all the oil in the imperialist way that the British Empire used to do. Interestingly, I found, I, I remember diving down a rabbit hole on a Greyhound bus uh, a few uh, a while ago, just lo- reading through Wikipedia, it surprised me that this was one of those few, or what I perceive to be one of the few instances where it was the Americans telling the Brits not to fuck around and find out, and not the other way around. Eisenhower was saying to Churchill, "Please, for the love of God, do not go doing this because you'll like all hell will break loose." And then, lo and behold, we had the. Islamic Revolution in 1979, the Shah was overthrown, tossed into exile, the Ayatollah came in. There's only been two since. The supreme leaders, Khomeini and Khomeini, I forget which one is the current one, but essentially Iran as a political system is a supreme leader who is just done by succession. And then there are presidents, and the presidents are largely appointed under the guise of democratic elections. So, for all intents and purposes, an authoritarian state. Iran is... Now, do you know which which of the two Islamic bits is Iran? What is that? The, the, Shun, the Sunnis and Sunni, Shia? Sunni, Sunni or Shia. Is it, is it Shia? They are Shia. There you go. And Shia, Shia is the minority uh, sect. I think you could sort of say around it. They comprise about, I think, fifteen to twenty percent of Muslims. The majority of the Muslims around them are Sunnis, and as a result, it's kind of like being surrounded by your cousins that you hate. Accurate. Accurate. So yeah. the Iranians are like, well. Nobody around us likes us and we don't like them. And after the Second World War, the UN decided to uh, essentially settle Europe's Jewish population also somewhat on our doorstep, and we really don't get along well with them. So the Iranians have for a while attempted to produce nuclear weapons 
not least because they know that the Israelis have them. The Israelis do not confirm that they have them because it's this policy of deliberate ambiguity because they live in an absolute powder keg of a part of the world. But it's it's kind of an open secret yeah. because Mark Tha- Margaret Thatcher's son was caught selling lithium to them back in the 1970s. Listen, he got he got down that one. All right, I got to give you. You want to talk about mm-hmm. wild boys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But long story short, the Iranians have a nuclear weapons program that they claim is a nuclear energy program. The Israelis do not like it. As close allies to the Israelis, the U.S. do not like it. Now. This is where the plot thickens, because creating normal uranium, you can't just stick in a bomb and say, throw it over there and boom, mushroom cloud, doesn't work. Oppenheimer you have not taught me that much, at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, I was quite surprised to, I, I didn't, it embarrasses me as, as, as somebody who graduated with a physics degree. I didn't actually realize that all of the modern ones are no longer fission bombs like yeah. Fat Boy and uh, or, or, uh, Fat Man and Little Boy were. Oh okay. uh, those are the small tactical ones. Mm-hmm. I'm nerding out on nuclear weapons, but ultimately the Ur- the Iranians have what is strongly suspected to be a nuclear weapons program that they claim is a nuclear energy program. Now to go from energy grade uranium to weapons-grade uranium, you essentially have to um, distill it down. You have to get a higher purity of uranium. And what they do is they take a comp- a, a ga- they make it into a gas called uranium hexafluoride, and they throw it into centrifuges. Mossad and the CIA said, how do we screw up this program? We more or less know is about making weapons that we absolutely do not want them to have because it's a very destabilizing thing in the region. Q Stuxnet. 2005-ish, this plot is hatched. Mossad and the CIA decide we need something that's going to screw around with their program. So they decide to try and break the centrifuges. And they do it. Ultimately, what they end up doing is doing it so minutely that the Iranians don't notice for years. 2005, they start this off. The first viable version of it they have around about 2007. And they really slowly sort of leak this in. This is proper long-term subterfuge that goes on. They go through Dutch intelligence. There's numerous different uh, contractors and subcontractors that they pose as trying to get into this facility in a place called Natanz, where all of these centrifuges exist. These centrifuges that spin this gas so much that all of the useful bits kind of separate out. Now, with it being the time that it was, this was the Bush presidency. In 2008, it was found that Iran were accelerating their enrichment process. So there was uh, fears that they were going to be able to build a bomb by 2010. And by all accounts, I don't think, I mean, the noises say that they've still not achieved it yet. So this really did succeed Absolutely. yeah but with the help of dutch intelligence mossad and the cia managed to get this virus into natanz now the reason that this was so difficult to do was that mission impossible reference what was special about natanz wasn't it really really not online oh yeah it was as air gapped as you could get air gapping. Yep. So for those for the uninitiated, air gap basically means none of these systems had any access to the internet. Zero. So you cannot get it in remotely. And this is realistically where the where people started realizing that USB drives were a genuine threat. Sure. Like, do not pick up a USB drive in the parking lot and plug it in because you could screw up your Iranian, your, uh, Iranian uranium centrifuges. This is where and I think it became a thing. I think this is that, it, that it seminal is. moment where it's, you know, it's, it's like, look both ways before you cross the street. This is now one of those just don't pick up random USBs that you find lying around. Why? Because Stuxnet happened. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. 
And the, the other thing, so tracking back slightly as well, I do. I can't find the source for this. Like the, the article seems to have just kind of disappeared. But I do remember reading somewhere a little while ago, and this is why you shouldn't trust. Uh, this is why you shouldn't trust unsolicited contact from uh, profiles of apparently beautiful ladies online. One of the technicians at Natanz was yeah. romance scams yes. yep. into getting parts of this malware into the facility. It was, and I think it was like they impersonated like a a Turkish German, a, a German model of Turkish descent, yeah. or something like that. Like, so they kind of they they really did their research it was like as well. A model like what kind like of pop star or something? Yeah, I remember reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they really did their research. And this is I'm I'm and this is this is where the devious of Mossad and, and CIA get in because I'm they they found out who these guys were. They used like social media profile and open source intelligence. And they were like, okay, so this guy, this dude, this dude's Iranian, he's Muslim, he's gonna, like, what's his profile of woman going to be? Sure. And they crafted a profile of a woman that would be just his type and did the kind of pig butchering romance scam piece and was like, ooh, you know, I'm a model. And yeah. I want to be with you. Can you do me this favor? <laughs> so just a teensy little bit of favor and then. We could figure this out. And what, what I want to jump in with really quick is that was back then where you could craft mm -hmm. the profile, you could dial it down to be bespoke for the exact target that you needed. Yeah. And all that information was available. Of course, we're talking about Mossad and the CIA. So at the time, they, they had amazing capabilities. They still do. I'm not saying that. But that was back then where... We were still in like web 1.5, 2.0. Now we're yeah. in web three or four. Imagine the type of targeting that can be done today. I just want to Absolutely throw that out wild. Yeah. So then in 2000, and moving on to 2009, uh, by this point, the attackers have deployed several CIA and Mossad have deployed several versions of the malware against the facility. And by all accounts, They've kind of achieved their uh, they've achieved their mission here. They've they've screwed up the centrifuges just enough that they know that it's mission success, but the Iranians haven't actually figured out what's going on. And potentially won't for a little while. We move into 2010. So this this thing had been deployed for a, somewhere in the region of two to three years before anybody really even found out. So by July 2010, a researcher has actually discovered stuck snap again the details on this are a little bit sketchy because it's kind of it's all cloak and daggers and uh it's, been, it's still very much it's, the, it's, the particulars are still very much classified this is this is something that's yeah. not even officially cop to i think by the respective agencies this is one of those oh well hold, hold the phone oh? it's 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 not but but somebody let slip oh so yeah here we go so this this is where the the not plot so much thickens, but we start getting an idea of what's gone on. So July, it's kind of discovered. Again, the details around it are sketchy. This isn't the most well-documented piece of subterfuge in, in cyber history. By August, a copy of Stuxnet has been uh, grabbed from the internet. Mm -hmm. So this, and this is where it hops the fence. And this is where it starts. Like, and this is something that the CIA and Mossad did not, anticipate happening this was kind of i think they wanted all of this stuff to just completely fly under the radar and they never really get found out and somebody somewhere screwed up or something happened that they didn't anticipate and we end up with a hundred thousand computers globally by the end of 2010 infected with stuxnet now for many devices this isn't a problem because you are only in any sorts of issues, if you're using the particular Siemens pro programmable logic controllers, mm -hmm. so the, the industrial control systems that have been managing these centrifuges, but it doesn't mean that unexpected behaviors can't be caused uh, by the Stuxnet malware. But ultimately, this was the confirmation to the security community that 
cybersecurity or, or hacking was now no longer the preserve of the programmer nerding out with something like the Melissa virus and just causing chaos to email systems. A lot of people, this was a legitimate, yeah, exactly. yeah, this was a legitimate weapon of warfare. Mm -hmm. This was a means of waging, waging war by proxy without ever having to fire a shot without ever having to set boots on the ground and it was i think the advent of you, you piloted or you test cased right you proof of concepted hybrid warfare that we see today completely absolutely yeah, exactly the same exactly the sort of stuff that we see in ukraine at the moment and we know those of those of you who listen to us will know that we've, we've talked about that it's been a thing in Ukraine for a decade. Yep, Georgia. Right? Prior famous... to that, that was the dress rehearsal for then what happened in in the Set, Ukraine. Yeah. Yep, South Ossetia. Mm -hmm. It's it's been it's a favored tool of the Russian government for over a decade. It's effective, sadly, right? Like it's it's this is, and I think, like you like you're saying, this was also I think one of the most intriguing parts of it you, you touched on earlier was because it was a complex adaptive system, a complex system. You have, you know, cause and effect not being co-joined co -joined in time and space. It was the ability, really, to kind of just set off a whole chain of events that eventually led to the, the, the nuclear program getting destabilized. It's yeah, wild. no, for sure. And this was, so I've got here, you know, it was, they managed to screw up 20% 20, 20 of the centrifuges, a, hundred, uh, a thousand out of 5,000 of them. Were, were screwed up uh, but by 2011 a video has been created and this is where it got out this is this is when this is when we had a feeling of who had done this video is created to celebrate the retirement of israeli defense force head uh gaby ashkenazi which i find really funny because ashkenazi are like actually a, 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 yeah it's a it's a subset exactly. of the Jewish faith. It's like saying it's, Omar Puerto uh, Rico or, or Jewish right? people. I think yeah, yeah. Like Johnny Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, ID, IDF head Gabi Ashkenazi, uh, video celebrating his retirement, listed Stuxnet as one of the successes under his watch. Yeah. Now the cynic in me says that the Israelis did this very deliberately, like poking fun, being like. Yeah, we did this to you, sure. but we'll never officially admit it. We just want you to. It's um, it's what's a face Hightower from uh, Game of Thrones. Tell Cersei I want her to know it was me. Yes, yes, absolutely. Then 2012, New York Times releases a piece that states that the U.S. government was involved. They actually ordered this the attack. Bush gave the green light to it. Um, an operation officially dubbed. Olympic Games. That's a throwback. I don't quite know why. Oh, what? It, it was against Iran, and and remember they uh, they took people hostage during the Olympic Games oh, back in the seventies. Yeah, was that Munich? Mm -hmm. Yes, one hundred percent. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. that makes an awful lot of sense. Which, oh, and there's your there's your Arab Spring connection as well. Yes, yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, I wouldn't have made that connection. I was I was puzzled by it for a little while. So, yeah. So we. I mean, we have the, here in the notes, you know, impact and aftermath, but really we've kind of already covered it. This is, it, it was the dawn of proxy cyber warfare. This, this belongs on the Mount Rushmore of cyber attacks in the modern era, in my opinion. This is mm -hmm. one of those just absolutely pivotal moments showing that like in a in a bad you know Japanese anime where right? where the the cyber element jumps into the physical world and suddenly you have creepy things going on on your way to school right I'm thinking of a very specific one and anybody that'll you know go in the comments and list which one it is I'll I'll send you a prize but it's really it's creepy <laughs> this is this is one of those and you can't not even be remotely a part or interested in this field without this this will come up. It's, and and what and who knows what I'm interested in is right when the two of us are old as as all get out. What's going to finally come out as a result? Maybe stuff gets declassified, right? If you could, you know, Freedom of Information Act it down the road. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't, I don't probably not because mm -hmm. I think that there's that there's things that are you know, that tie back to it. But um, I love how you very, try to be very even handed 
with potentially, allegedly this, that, and the third, my man, right? At this stage, at this stage later. Well, again, well, we learned, we learned from our favorite misogynist, Andrew Tate, unless you've got actual solid documentation around it. And, and I've no doubt, I've no doubt that it does exist around Stuxnet. It's just bloody hard to find. Yes. Like I've, I've done hours of searching on this and the only, I said the only things that I can come up with are multiple different articles that do not corroborate other. In fact, some of them directly contradict each other. Yep. So yeah, it's it's a fucker of a story yeah, to cover. And even and, so, and we even, do have to just say it allegedly. And, 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 and even inside of the field, which gives me, you know, I'm this is a good thing. Folks that were around aren't talking. Aren't talking either. Mm. So let me ask you, this kind of depends on who you are, but what do we learn from Stuxnet? What do we learn as the average Joe? And then what do we learn as a business? Well, I think first off the list, again, why, why we keep going back to the well and why this is such a, an informative event in the history of cyber warfare and, and cybersecurity in general is the logical and physical world are intertwined. You can't you can't play games with thinking that okay, if you get hacked, your computers are going to go down. We alluded to it. There's a reason why I picked that as one of the three stories, of course, that we covered today. This was that moment that told you, oh, this cyber stuff can affect me physically. I think that's the first first and foremost. And if anything, since what 2010, roughly, there's been 14 years. That's only accelerated right now. Now we're in the age of what we're having with uh, autonomous cars, right? Or smart devices or water treatment facilities, power plants, whatnot. Mm -hmm. There's, you're not getting away from your cyber hygiene, not potentially having a negative effect on your physical well-being. For sure, yeah. sure. I'm going to say what I want to say. What I take from it, don't plug in random USBs. Of course, that's that's because you might screw up your entire country's newspaper. Yeah, program. And, and trust me, it could be one of the like you said. I love how you know it jumped the fence. There's, there's who knows, right? With with what's going on, and uh, now in the it, age it, of supply chain attacks, you might not yeah, think you're target, it is. but you are. It didn't. It didn't come from a wet market. <laughs> it escaped a lamb. Wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna let that one. I'm gonna let that one simmer. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Everything's alleged. Of course. It's just. Yeah. I heard. I heard. Okay. Right. I think we. Well, as usual, we finish off with certification corner. You have for us this week. Pentest Plus. Tell us, tell us what is Pentest Plus. Continuing. You did the blue team stuff last time. You're going the red team. Of course, now, and aren't it's you? it's and it's continuing with the theme of CompTIA. Uh, shout out to CompTIA if you want to throw us some vouchers that we could give away to our awesome listeners. Not going to say no, um, but might try and see what affiliate program they. Why got. not? Really, um, Pentest Plus, as you said, red team. This is absolutely a nod towards getting on the offensive side of things. You're going to be breaking in. You're going to be a cyber burglar. Of course, it's going to be white hat hacking, cyber, cyber burglar. burglar, right? That's the, I mean, that was the allure 10 years ago, right? A bright, a doe eyed, uh, bushy tailed, uh, young Omar was like, ah, I could, you know, be a cyber burglar. Why not get into it? I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm loving the, I'm loving the sort of mental image that I have the standard kind of like burglar with the stripy of course uh, yeah. the stripy top and the swag bag yep. but instead of stripes it's just like ones and zeros 100 percent, and still with the little raccoon <laughs> mask still right, oh, yeah. old-timey old-timey mask not a balaclava that's a little too too crazy but this is you know it's a it's a very strong offering from comp ta it's absolutely a little bit more advanced I wouldn't be, you know, go hard charging into it after after your sec plus. Give yourself some time. Also, let yourself meander towards the subject matter if it gels with what you want to be pursuing. There's there's also very you know very reason for that. Um, if there's it's a second edition already. 
Um, I think, uh, oof, I was an old man and I think I took uh, the first edition. So <laughs> hooray me. Uh, but it's uh, 85 questions. Can mm -hmm. I ask a question? Are we ever going to get to a certification that you've not taken? No, there's a ton. Uh, well, I say that. <laughs> I say that, you know, and then again, my wife you know, gets mad at me when I start getting sad after taking one and passing it. There's fewer to take. And she goes, cool. You can, you know, be a human again. But uh, each, each certification is like a gateway drug to the 100 percent. Right. You get the, the one ping of happiness and then it's, you know, it's back to I think it's diminishing. It, it really is. It's just the, the it gets less sweet. You know, I'm chasing that dragon. Uh, but it's one of the it's, <laughs> certification. It's, it's, that's me. So, you know, it's still roughly a maximum of 85 questions. I think they still do the thing where they intersperse maybe 10 that are going to be test material for the next iteration, but they won't tell you what it is. Scale mm -hmm. one, 100 to 900, they do some weird math foo so that you don't quite exactly know, hey, you need a 65 or 75 to pass. It's it's a score gotcha. that they come up with. Uh, you get a smidge under uh, uh, three hours to tackle this. Uh, the prerequisites and the recommended experience, nothing hard and fast yet. I've started to see a trend, as we discussed with the Security Plus, where they go right up to the line of saying, hey, get the Network Plus before you take this. Please, please, please. Uh, I endorse that move. I think having a solid foundation in networking is, you want to talk about gateway drugs, it's the absolute gateway drug to just a fruitful IT career. If you don't know how stuff talks to each other, how are you going to defend it, uh, tinker with it, improve it? Etc. So Network Plus is listed on here. Of course, the Security Plus is on here. That just makes sense. If you're taking this before the Security Plus, we need to have a conversation, right? I've led you astray. What are you doing? Uh, it's it's a silly it's a silly way to go. They're putting it at still three to four years of hands-on experience. So this is absolutely not something that you want to take in order to then jump into the career. And for any job posters or hiring managers that would do this, um, I'm going to look at you really hard if you're putting this on entry level jobs, right? I will name and shame. I will sh reshare that posting and I will go, what the devil is going on? And that's the nicest thing I'll say. Um, it's, it's one of my number one. Please. What the cis on an entry my, my... level? Like, that's just nonsense. Like, please. Well, that, there's like, I mean, <sighs> In in recent times, I have seen not required but preferred, and even if you're saying but preferred on a, a CISP or CISM on an entry level, you're an absolute cretin of a, a hiring piece manager. of garbage is what I want. I'm yeah. happy to tell hiring managers to their face yeah. if you are asking for qualifications that require five years of experience on an entry level uh, on an entry level job posting. Get the fuck out. Yeah, get fucked. It's straight up, <laughs> just hard. Do not pass go. Do not collect two hundred dollars. In fact, in fact, you've got, in fact, you've got no right to be a hiring I, manager. I'll repost it, share it, in order to flame it on LinkedIn. That is, I, I very <laughs> rarely get into those internet beefs again. My, my late thirties have taught me patience and less pettiness, slightly, believe it or not. But that is something, folks are already trying their hardest to get in, and I think also the the game needs all the great folks it can. So there's just this weird hiring practice nonsense. This is, but, you know, going back to the point, this is not something you take when you're just starting out. It's something you take to validate skills nope. that you like uh, to, to hone, right. And showing that you like mm -hmm. this side of the, uh, the cyber skill set. Um, it's still relatively affordable. I will say relatively okay. affordable because, you know, there was one that I self-funded back in the day. I won't name names. We will on another show. That was $1,000. And I was getting it to try to try to get in. I self-funded because I wanted to get yeah. into the field. This, thankfully, the voucher itself is a, is a smidge over 400 Obviously, they offer training packages, CompTIA. You know, again, it's one of those. Oh, yeah. yeah, they... Cert Master is amazing. I will say that essentially, if you go through the Cert Master for any or any Cert that they offer, and you score consistent nineties, it's a coronation, is what the what the real Cert is. Honest to goodness, but that's really pricey. So you have to kind of pick your poison. The alternatives that I would recommend for folks, you know, uh, uh, hackers on a budget, would be I'm mm -hmm. a big fan of the Try Hack Me uh, Pen Test Plus route. 
Oh yeah. That is well, try hack me as a as a platform just is amazing. I love I love the folks there. I think they're from your side of the pond there, Robin. So shout out. I, I believe that. I believe I, thought... I might be just confusing them with uh Maybe. Hack the Box or Vaughn Hub, but one of those three, if not two of those three, are are based in, in Europe. But this this room from Try Hack Me, it's the CompTIA Pen Test Plus. I believe the a big chunk of it still is free. You don't have to sign up for the subscription in order to, to get access to it. And it is just okay. it's a it's wall to wall goodies. You get a lot of hands on stuff, which is helpful because yes, this is one of those certs that you have practical questions for. This is actually the first one when I first took it a few years ago that I saw those practical questions being debuted mm -hmm. by CompTIA and now they've gone ahead and done them for the SISA as well as even I think for the SEC plus. So this is the OG for, for practical questions. I, I love taking yeah. it. it. It was, it, this was a fun one. Um, it, it really, it opens your eyes to a whole other side of the InfoSec house. Um, you know, on top of that, I think there is kind of in the mid range between free 99 from try hack me and a bazillion mm -hmm. dollars from comp TIA for the training, yeah. not the voucher. Um, my, okay. my good friend, Dion, Jason Dion training offers, you know, about like eh, another 400 bucks, his course wall to wall goodies as well. Still, you know, there, there's the price component there outside of that, you know, you, you grab your books from uh you know the official the official books i think it's cybex you know the 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 white uh, and red lettering the og comp ta books yeah. that they always offer and you just go to town this this is a fun mm -hmm. one you're a you're a special breed when you say things that like you enjoy taking exams <laughs> or it was an enjoyable exam to take i think i've had that happen as many times as I can count on one hand. And that's purely because I was like, I know the answers to this. It, it does, it does make a lot of sense that when you said, cause you said it, it was 85 questions. I was thinking, what are these exams? That kind of like seems a little bit light. And then you said it was like three hours. I was like, that is really, that's really light for, that's a really light number of questions for three hours. I did, I did suspect that they were going to be practical a lot of take them. your time yep. through a lot them. Of them gonna have a to, lot of them are gonna have to run it. absolutely a lot of them are and i think yeah. what they've started to do and you know they haven't changed the version of the test it's still version two but i think in latest mm -hmm. iterations of the test they've started to do more practical than before it was you know they really just introduced them on version one gotcha. and i think on version two they upped yep. the amount of, of practical because that's one of those differentiators where it's not just a multiple choice test, but you're, you're spot on Robin. It's it on its face. It doesn't seem like a lot, but the type of questions it's asking you and the type of reading you're going to have to do and, and the type of analysis. Yeah. 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 Is that open book? No, I think guess, no, no. Oh, oh goodness. No, no. Conti. Oh, it feels like it. Mm -hmm. It feels like it should be. Listen, it's, Ooh. And that's where we'll get into those, I think, down the road, like the open book or the, yeah. uh, you know, the more the OSCPs or the PNTPs mm -hmm. where it just hears some targets go nuts. Yeah. Those are definitely, I would say, on the coronation or the higher end of the red team side of, of certification land here. But this is this is like your midway through. But yeah, CompTIA is not not known for doing open book for, I believe for any of its exams at this point. Yeah. Ooh, interesting. Uh, what kind of role is somebody going to be in if they want to be taking this? Are they going to be like security ops center? What are they going to be? They're going to be much more on your red team slash purple team side of things. This okay. is going to be maybe your risk assessment team or um, your, yeah. you know, your logical pen testing, or even if you want to be, the logical SME on a full fledged physical red team, right? Or which would uh, I think go hand in hand with what we mm -hmm. discussed uh, earlier in, in the episode, right? You can be the the person that's hacking okay. at the the computer systems on an overall you know, cyber and physical pen test. Uh, that's that's really where you're gonna you're I think you're gonna leverage the skills that you're gonna develop to uh, validate on this exam. That's where you're gonna you're gonna find some good roles. Neat. And this really is for the people who want to do, as far as their role in security, they want to be doing 
the hacking yep. thing, but not getting arrested. Hundred percent. It. It's uh, I love the little logo for it, which I think puts not the point. It's the white hat on mm -hmm. the uh, the old uh, old timey server there. You know, uh, so I think yeah, you, you want to do this. It's going to be ethical hacking. I think for my money, at, and for the price point, and as well as where in your career you you take this. It's probably one of the strongest ones there. The only one which we can cover, I guess, I, as I said, down the road to be like a PNTP from TCM Security, which is just, I, I love anything that they produce. So we can get into that down the road. Neat. Very, very good. Well, if you have any questions, our dear audience, or want to know more about something like Pentest Plus or indeed CISA that we discussed in the last episode, Feel free to drop questions in the comments. Uh, Omar will be happy to get back to you on them. Love I'd love to do it, but I don't have the depth of knowledge that he does. So uh, that is that really. What's the next sensible step on from a, from a pen test plus? Where would you go next? I think just to round out the skill set, if you double down on red teaming, then I think the mm -hmm. ones I mentioned, you can do you know, the, the EJPT or the, the, uh, the practical pen test, the PPT, PNTP from TCM security, or of course the old, uh, the granddaddy of them all, the OSCP from OFSEC, the producers and maintainers of the Kali, uh, the uh, Kali Linux distribution, which is the, the one that's oh, tailored. Yeah. It's tailored to, to hacking, uh, which I'd, I'd love to dig into those, uh, on successive episodes, but what I think we might, as a teaser, cover on the next one would be mm -hmm. the crowning achievement for, for now. I hope they produce more because then I get to go and take more. For now, it's the CASP from, from you CompTIA. You love CASP. Yes, I do. But also, these these discussions, these cert corner discussions, always highlight to me we have way too many acronyms. Yes. Oh, yeah. In terms of... Drew, yeah. right. And, okay, it's fine. The, it makes things easy to say, but good Lord, do we have to do a lot of defining. <laughs> right. So on that bombshell, let's do a quick recap. So we're talking Pentest Plus. It's for if you've been three, four years in the game, you've done your Security Plus, you've done your Network Plus, ideally, because otherwise you're going to find yourself in some hot water. It's if you want to do offensive security, so you want to do the good guy hacking, not the defensive stuff. Round about the 400-ish mark, naturally the courses and whatnot will run you into higher. But if you're a well self, no, a, if you're a, an accomplished self-directed learner, you may do perfectly fine simply with the exam voucher. And that's from CompTIA. Yes. Next steps on, which we will get into in subsequent weeks, would be potentially something like CAS. Yes. <laughs> and the dog went nuts. exactly the okay dog's a red teamer i could tell i could tell from from the jump absolutely <laughs> absolutely he's a little little psycho it's all my wife at the window okay i might leave that in on that very very barky bombshell we shall leave you for this week or to match the intro avida zane adios and uh, <laughs> there are many links between the Germans and the Spanish. I don't know. Anyway, once again, I'll be the same, and we will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Thank you, and bye bye.